Well, let's go ahead and dive right in. Welcome everyone to this episode of Net DevOps Live. Joining me today is Kevin Corbin, back to talk about more Net DevOps goodness. The topic of today is Pi ATS, a free tool from Cisco that you can use to verify and test and run configurations and, and all sorts of good stuff against your network as you're going through your Net DevOps pipeline and development process. As always, throughout the session, if you've got any questions, feel free to drop those in the chat or the Q&A panel. We'll be watching those and answering throughout today's session. And if you're looking for the slides or links to labs and resources, those are also already available up on the website for NetDevOps Live. You can find those and I'll drop the link direct to it here into the chat window in just a moment. With that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Kevin so he can take us away. Thanks. Thanks, Hank, and welcome, everyone. Um, as by way of an introduction here, uh, what we're going to talk about today is PyATS, as Hank mentioned. We're going to go through sort of what the vision that the PyATS framework uh, has in mind with a preview of some things that are come. We'll talk through you know, where PyATS came from and then start to sort through some of the various components, uh, PyATS and Genie. And then as always, we'll end with uh, a series of demos showing you the power of the framework. So in the, in the testing and validation and really the broader network de net DevOps space, you know, we focus a lot on the configuration management pieces of it, of, of how we kind of push configuration down to devices. But a larger majority of the use cases that I run into with customers have to do with this notion of a device check, where it's a combination of what is the configura configurational state plus the operational status of that configuration and customers have a large desire to kind of create this device health check notion. And, and certainly we see that as being a piece where the PyATS framework can fit into, but there's also a much broader vision that uh, the PyATS team has around this continuous network verification, right? So whether you're a network engineer, you know, a developer working on a new service or a customer of it, we wanna provide a dashboard where you can go in and, and you know, propose network changes, uh, get reporting as to what the impact of that would be from the network, uh, integrate in with things like Jenkins, and then also be able to have integrations into kind of lab as a service components where maybe this isn't your production network, but you want to spin up a viral topology, or you have a hardware-based lab and you want to you know, allocate resources, uh, create a test bed, and then execute your network tests on that uh, for you know, pre-change, sort of diligence kind of use cases and things like that. Today, what we're gonna focus in on is the testing environment uh, comprised largely of PyATS and Genie, uh, but stay tuned for some announcements from the PyATS team around the S3 dashboard and lab as a service components that are shown on this slide. Those are uh, you know, gonna be available to you uh, shortly. So, when we talk about PyATS, I think it's important to note what, kind of where this came from. Originally, PyATS was a framework that was launched internally at Cisco for the purpose of providing our various product owners with a common framework that they could use to test new features that they were implementing or to do regression tests against uh, you know, new software versions for their platforms. And so this has been used in a big way in Cisco since 2014. Uh, we have over 3,000 of our engineers that, that represent the various products uh, um, that are using the framework to test their features and do the sanity tests that I mentioned. Uh, we have over 5 million lines of test cases that we use to validate uh, all of the various platforms. And we're using uh, PyATS test runs at a, at a pace of over a million per month as we continue to announce our features. The change here is that uh, a little about a year ago, we started saying, hey, wait a second, if we're doing all of this internal testing and there's value for us, uh, it's, it's likely that our customers could find some value in some of these things as well. And so we released uh, PyATS and Genie through DevNet, as I said, about a year ago. And so now you can uh, download this and start doing your own verifications and validations on uh, your network. As a result of that release to DevNet, um, the PyATS development team was recognized with one of the most prestigious awards that Cisco gives internally, which is our Pioneer Award. So I just wanted to take a minute and congratulate the PyATS team and, and then candidly thank them, right? As we've taken this to market, guys like Hank and myself have been out here evangelizing the, the product and framework, and the team has just been absolutely wonderful to work with. 
uh, and also a thank you for uh, helping me with some of the slides for today's presentation, guys. So uh, big kudos to this team. Uh, if you, you know, a lot of them are active on Twitter. So uh, if you take a moment, reach out, congratulate them, and thank them as well for uh, making such a great product available to the field and to the customer base. So diving into what Pi ATS is, you know, one of the feedback that I get from customers as we start, uh, uh, you know, introducing this is there are a lot of moving parts to the framework, and so one of the goals of today's session is to really help kind of demystify what all of the components are, and so we're going to kind of take it from the bottom up here, which is we're going to focus on what is the Pi ATS core test infrastructure, how we layer on top of that the Genie library framework, uh, as well as some specific Genie libraries and then touch on some of the integrations that are possible. And, and in the integrations area here at the top, you may recognize the robot framework from some of the other NetDevOps live sessions that we've done. Uh, this is where we've kind of abstracted some of the underlying uh, pieces and parts of Pi ATS. And, and so today's session is really about kind of pulling back the curtain and showing you, you know, the magic behind the, what's been abstracted with the robot framework to date in a lot of these events. So diving right in, Pi ATS is is I think the most th important thing to remember is that it's Pythonic, right? It's a it's it does some things that are necessary for all of your test cases and all of the operations that you might have in your organization. And it really that when we say Pi ATS, it's sort of overloaded to mean the overall framework, but more specifically, Pi ATS is really the common infrastructure and object-oriented programming paradigm that represents the most fundamental things that we know no matter what test case you're going to execute, uh, these are things that are going to be needed regardless of what your test is actually doing and regardless of what type of device that you're testing this with. So things like connecting to devices and executing show commands and executing configuration commands, those are handled by the core Pi ATS framework. Um, of note here is that the, the entire framework uh, is developed with it in an agile manner. And so the, the turnaround time for bug fixes and uh, you know, new features is, is very, uh, very quick. Uh, and we've, we've tested the limits of that with the team, uh, you know, getting ready for some of these sessions at Cisco Live and, and getting ready for the release here to the customer base. So um, because it's Python, another important thing is, is while the framework gives you a lot of sort of out of the box tools to use, at the end of the day, it is just Python. So if you have other libraries that you're already using or other parsers or you know, other work that you've already done, those things can be leveraged immediately. They get the force multiplier of getting all of the common framework that Pi ATS provides. You get reusability and robustness in your code. So it's sort of a win-win situation. Now we're going to dive into a couple of the kind of fundamental things to understand about what Pi ATS provides. And, and at the center of that is this notion of a test bed. And, and when we talked about this, when we had this tool internally, these test beds were, you know, absolutely large scale test beds with just hundreds or even thousands of the devices that weren't really serving a production uh, function. They were just there for the, the business units to do their testing and, and make sure that their new releases were, uh, you know, were stable and they didn't introduce any regression bugs and that sort of thing. As we pivot and, and make this available to our customers, that use case is certainly still valid, right? If you have a lab or you're using something like Viral to, to validate and, and mock up network changes, uh, uh, you, know, you can certainly use the test bed or think of the test bed in that manner. But as you pivot towards using kind of your production network, right, the network itself becomes the test bed. And what we do in the test bed is we say that everything in that test bed, all of the devices, all of the links, everything's an object because it's Python. And we want to use object attributes to store things about the device. Is it running BGP? Is it HA? Uh, uh, you know, connect to the device, right? We also want to have relationships that point to other things. In the, in the diagram here, see it, you can see that the CSR is connected via an interface to a link that's connected to another device, which is the NXOS device. And so because of these, we can sort of map through these relationships to get to the other side of a link or connect to the device on the other side of a link uh, um, through the notion of a test bed. 
The test beds themselves become a YAML file, right? So if you've worked with Ansible or some of the other kind of open source projects out there, YAML is something you're probably familiar with. And what we're really doing here is we're describing both the the you know connectivity information. Here are all of the you know the inventory related stuff. Here are all the devices in my network. Here are all the connections. Uh, you can see in the connections key there we have a console connection. We can support multiple of those. So if a device is accessible via SSH or through a console connection on a terminal server, you know we can represent all of those various connectivity profiles in the same test bed. And so for you know in the case of destructive testing where the device may go offline, we can revert back to a console connection if we need to. Or for basic connectivity things, we can actually say, can we SSH into the device and is the connectivity uh, you know working through the network? Um, we also represent the, top, the desired topology state in there. So we can represent here are all the interfaces on a device, give a description of, of what that link is, uh, even encode some IP address information and things like that can, that can be used uh, during your validations to make sure that the network is actually configured the way that the topology is described. Uh, you know, in some of the early automation te uh, use cases, we talked about this in terms of kind of a cable check. Uh, uh, type of notion and that's very much possible with the, the framework as well here. And what you see on the left here is sort of the online help because it's Python, right? We can get kind of the, all of the attributes and things like that that are available on these various objects and we'll continue to explore some of the, the most common ones as we go through here. Um, I, I mentioned the test bed object, right? This is the highest level. Uh, test bed objects contain a number of devices, device objects contain a number of interfaces, interfaces contain a, you know, a link that they're associated with, and one or more interface and therefore one or more device can be connected to a link object and, and those can be resolved through a, a Python API. Now device objects are really where the thing gets interesting, right? So the topology, if the test bed and topology information is sort of your inventory, the devices are the actual thing that we're going to interact with, uh, you know, most commonly. And again, these are Python objects and those device objects represent the most common operations as methods to it. So I may have a device object that I want to connect to or I want to uh, you know, issue a ping from that device or execute a show command or a configuration command. Uh, I can do that directly by calling one of the appropriate methods uh, to run the command or perform the operation. And then from there, we can sort of use that output to either parse it directly if it's a you know, simple operation or we can use other libraries like Genie moving forward, which we'll discuss. Or if you're more familiar with TextFSM or if you're a regex, uh, you know, guy, you can absolutely do those kind of same things as well. Um, but that's sort of your device object. The other thing that the PyATS framework provides outside of the notion of the test bed and device objects is the idea of a test case, right? So what we're talking about here is testing and validating your network. And every network engineer sort of knows intuitively some things about their network. You know, some examples of this might be, uh, uh, you know, I want to test for a certain condition on a device, right? Well, what, what PyATS aims to provide you is you focus on the thing that you care about, which is that validation or that test. And the framework provides things like the common logging, how do we track the results in, in a multi-step test plan, um, you know, how do we introduce the logic to say I want to execute this test but I want to do it on you know, these hundred devices or I want to do this same test on all of the devices and that sort of basic control flow uh, is built into the, the framework for you. Um, the overall structure, and we'll deep dive on this, but, but a test script has kind of a common setup, right? What, what are the things that you want to do prior to executing your, your test? And in your lab environments, this might be things like as simple as connecting to all of the devices. Uh, it also may be something like maybe I want to start a traffic generator uh, um, or maybe I want to lay down a, a proposed network configuration that I'm going to validate. All of those things can be done in the common setup. Then we move into the uh, actual test cases. Here are the things that I want to validate. And then finally, we move into a common cleanup session where maybe if it's a shared lab environment, we, uh, you know, 
be a good good citizen and kind of clean up after ourselves and and re reset the test bed back the way that it was when we started so that the uh, the next user can can jump in and execute their test cases one thing to note here guys we are going through a lot of content uh, uh, very quickly in the slides that you guys will have available to you um, we we have you know, tried to put in the, the appropriate links for all of the relevant documentation for these libraries and things. And so, um, you know, the, the documentation for PyATS and all of the Genie libraries is extremely detailed and extremely good. I, I would highly recommend that you um, uh, uh, take a peek through some of this and kind of read up on it on your own. The team's done a phenomenal job of not only making the documentation comprehensive, uh, but they've actually made it entertaining. They've encoded use case stories or, or even, you know, kind of fictional characters into the documentation. So it's not uh, not the usual documentation that you read when you're having a, a hard time getting to sleep. This is something that you should find entertaining and, and valuable. Drilling into what we mean by a test case, right? When, when we think about network operations and, and sort of either in the validation or even sometimes in the troubleshooting steps, there's sort of a high level flow that ends up being is that we kind of go in, we check something via show command, we might change something via configuration, and then we you know rerun the same show commands and verify that the anticipated change uh, you know was actually made. What the test case allows you to do is, is codify that into a Python code that says, here are the show commands that I want to run, here's the configuration change that I want to make, and here's the verification. And should that verification change or deviate uh, you know, in an undesirable manner uh, as a result of the, the trigger, you know, which could be a, a configuration change or one of the, the pre-populated triggers that the framework provides, uh, then we can simply fail the test and, and kind of move on. Um, and as I mentioned, the common cleanup section, then we would you know, go through and make sure that the, the test bed is reset and clean up whatever configuration changes we made uh, in, in the test bed. And again, the framework, you know, a large part of what the framework does is to handle sort of the mundane details for you as to after you've written your test case, and you can see on the left, sort of a boilerplate test case in Python. Uh, there's a number of decorators that make looping easy. Uh, the common setup you, you know, routine is just a matter of subclassing uh, the built-in common setup library. Uh, and then test cases are just a number of classes which inherit from the, the test case base object. Uh, and you can see there's you know, ordered steps that go into the test case. I mentioned the looping capabilities and then finally the cleanup of a, uh, of, of a particular test case. After the Python actually executes, you don't have to worry about you know, the things like logging or printing the results out really nicely. The framework takes care of that for you, both in the console test report that you see on the top here, or if you so desire and need to kind of forward this on to your management, we can generate pretty HTML reports for you as well uh, that show you the high level summary, and then you can drill into each of the you know, test cases and, and see all of the various output that was logged and, and that was collected during the, the test run. Uh, all the, the, it is time stamped and can be integrated in with email notifications and, and kind of the stuff that you don't want to have to think about when you're just wanting to validate something in your network. So moving into Genie, uh, you know, we said, hey, Genie does stuff, right? And I think the important thing in, in the Pi ATS, we said it does things in Genie, it does stuff. It's not so much important like which one does which. Over time, as you start to work with the packages, you'll you'll kind of get a feel for where you know the things that you want to do versus the stuff you want to do. But but in general, I like to think of PyATS as things that I can touch. Right? It's devices. It's links. It's uh, uh, things that I want to do. Execute commands and so on. Genie, I like to think of as the stuff, right? It's the stuff that's a little bit more intangible. Things like OSPF or BGP or HSRP and the features that we're enabling on the things in our network, right? And, and they're a little bit more abstract in terms of, of I can't reach out and touch BGP, uh, but, but in the case of Genie, that's what Genie focuses on. It goes out and says BGP is configured on this device and I want to parse uh, BGP and I want to get that in structured data back uh, so that I can use it in one of my test cases. 
Genie really has kind of three high level libraries that are subcomponents of it. The genie.conf library, genie.ops, and genie.sdk. And for the network guys on the call here, right, we kind of have to map this back to things that we know. So if your automation or what you're trying to automate or validate requires that you go into config mode, uh, you can assume that, 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 that the library that you need to start looking at is the genie.conf library. If it's running a bunch of show commands, right, that's going to be in genie ops. And if it's more of a procedural thing, like maybe I want to clear IP BGP and then right after that do a show IP BGP and, and uh, you know, parse that data, these are going to be stored in the genie.sdk and, and are also known as triggers and verifications in that library. But in all cases, again, what we're doing is we're providing these feature-centric object models. So BGP is an object just like devices were an object. BGP has properties. What is the AS number? Uh, you know, what are the neighbors that BGP has at a device level? What are the kind of options for that neighbor, route reflector client? And we're providing structured data that we've derived by parsing the configuration and or the operational state of that data. And, and I think that's really the value of Genie is that so many of our customers are working with libraries like TextFSM, uh, um, or you know regex and they're having to do a lot of screen scraping well here what we've done is we've provided those parsers both in a device agnostic way so that I can represent BGP as a as a thing uh, um, regardless of whether that BGP came from iOS XE or NXOS the data structure between those two objects from two different platforms is going to have the exact same schema so it makes it very easy for me to do things to my entire network because I've consolidated into a single data structure. They're also agnostic into the management interface that we get, right? We're, we're in a place in the, in, a, in the market right now where we're undergoing a transition between legacy device level interfaces like CLI and moving more towards Yang, RESTConf, and NetConf, and kind of XML data structures. So with all of these libraries, whether we get the information, uh, the configuration or operational information by going into the CLI, executing a number of show commands and parsing those into the data structure, or whether the device supports NetConf and Yang models and we use you know, NetConf to get that configuration or operational data, it doesn't so much matter and we end up again with that single object that is agnostic across platform and across management interface. Genie is also plug and play, right? So we have over 400 different parsers in the configuration and operations space that represent the most common use cases that we see, again, both internally and now from our customer base. And this continues to get uh, uh, you know, additional uh, um, you know, capabilities moving forward but but the thing that's important is that while there's these you know tremendous amount of parsers and tremendous amount of triggers and verifications that are out there you can only you, you only have to use what it is that you need right it's a very uh you know opt-in type of model for using these libraries and then as i mentioned it's also extensible right so if for some reason, you know, the basic out of the box parsers and object models that we provide you don't fit your need. Again, it's Python. We can inherit any of these objects and we can extend it or overwrite the behavior that, that is the default, uh, you know, very simply. And, and that way we can accommodate what your specific, uh, you know, test case requires. And one great example of that, right, is a, is a feature that we call the parser gen or the CLI auto parser. Um, so if you can imagine a command that, that, you know, is a show command on a given platform, right, they generally will fall into one or two categories that either the, the tabular type of output like you see here in a show ARP or a non-tabular output like you can imagine on a show interface. And there's a few of these methods in ParserGen which make it very easy for you to parse you know, that tabular or non-tabular data simply by providing the command and then, hey, what are header fields? And then all of the other heavy lifting is done for you and we'll parse that into to data structures like you see on the right here. So it's a much simpler way than the current uh, kind of state of the art in, in parsing output from devices is. 
Now, the triggers and verifications are an attempt. This, now we're moving on to the Genie SDK, and I've mentioned triggers and verifications a couple of times now. But imagine triggers being sort of in your testing environments, you know, as you're, you know, commissioning a new environment, right? You want to do some, you know, shut and no shut and interface and make sure your routing protocols converge or, uh, uh, you know, reconfigure BGP or add a BGP neighbor and make sure that that doesn't have any impact on the, uh, you know, on the network or, or device uh, um, operation. And then that goes hand in hand with the verifications, right? After we shut and no shut, we might want to run, a, you know, a verify BGP. And, and these also can be used in kind of a pre and post change manner. So again, sticking with that BGP use case, maybe in my testing environment, I want to, you know, remove all of the BGP configure or, or first take a snapshot of what the operational state of BGP is remove all of the BGP configuration, re-add all of the BGP configuration, and then make a post snapshot and then do a comparison before and after, right? In our production environments, you can think of these as maybe some you know, recovery actions, right? Where I have a, an automated troubleshooting script that tests for uh, a certain you know, condition in my network. And when that condition's uh, um, detected, Maybe I do a you know, clear IP route or a clear IP BGP or clear ARP or again, shut and no shut and interface. You know, what are the, whatever those things are that you have in your operational procedures, triggers and verifications provide a very quick way for you to uh, you know, automate those, those actions. And if you're feeling really brave, the triggers and verifications can also be your chaos monkey for your network where you sort of randomly select these and prove how resilient your net DevOps managed network is by uh, uh, doing some of these things on your production network in the middle of the day. Again, if you're feeling very, very brave. And then lastly, uh, that we wanna talk about in terms of the framework as we're moving up the stack here is these integrations, right? And so the integrations, uh, the one that we, we highlight the most is, is probably the robot framework. And if you've attended some of the other sessions, you've probably seen uh, a good deal of us talking about the robot framework. This is really after, you know, either the existing test case triggers and verifications or test cases that you've uh, developed yourself. You may not want to expose the raw Python behind that library to some, to some other consumer. And so we have integrations like the robot framework, which will help you abstract some of these things. And again, I've mentioned the before and after, right? So imagine, being able to go out uh, in a very high level kind of scripting language here, connect to a number of devices in my topology and profile the system for the configuration, the BGP operational data, the OSPF operational data, and all of the interface statistics and, and, uh, and store that as kind of a point in time that says, hey, the network is running really good when everything was like this that we profiled. And then, you know, at a later date, come back in and compare those profiles to how the network is running today. So we can detect, okay, well, wait a second, you know, on this particular device, maybe we lost a BGP neighbor or an OSPF neighbor or an interface is down or an interface is now experiencing CRC errors that it didn't before. Again, the heavy lifting of this is done in the back end by PyATS and Genie to parse all of that configurational and operational data. Uh, the, the frameworks just provide a kind of a nice interface to, to make it easier for the, you to consume uh, those things after they're built. And, and we can also do some things like, you know, testing uh, uh, expected values, right? For my core routers, I may want to make sure that at all times I have this many OSPF neighbors or I have this many interfaces that are up. Um, or I want to make sure that all of the devices are in an HA state that have multiple supervisors. Uh, and continue to you know, run BGP neighbors in a particular VRF. All of those things, again, very, very high level keyword based approach to this. And also it's worth mentioning that the robot framework or even more broadly things like Jenkins or other testing frameworks out there, these may be used in a broader sense in an organization. And so having these integrations is easy for us to um, uh, uh, you know, kind of fit into the existing tool chain there. And when you think about the robot framework, 
This also maps very nicely into if you wanted to say create a chat bot for some of these verifications where your network operations center, rather than having to log in to do all of the you know, show commands and, and parse that, you know, compare or uh, stare and compare between you know, different show commands on devices and before and after snapshots, uh, those things can be done you know, by integrating very easily into your chat box that you might be building or chat ops as the, as the industry is kind of termed. And you can see here we have a number of the other uh, you know, uh, keywords available, both in terms of learning, parsing, running these triggers, running these verifications, um, and kind of the, the variable mapping that goes into the Python behind the scenes is, is outlined here. Um, definitely check the documentation on this and, and see uh, if, you, if it's worthwhile for you to, to abstract some of your test cases and verifications with something like Robot. With that, I'm going to pause for a second here. Hank, do we have any questions in the Q&A? You know, we've had actually several questions that have been all really good. I think I've covered most of them. There was a question that came in recently. Is the, um, is the parser code and uh, elements open sourced with Genie on those areas? I'm, I'm providing some links and stuff inside of the question panel, but you might want to tackle that one live as well. Yeah, all of the parsers and libs and, and ver triggers and verifications are open sourced. Um, they're available on GitHub, and, and we'll provide the links to those repositories, uh, um, you know, in the show notes or whatever. Uh, there are a few components of the PyATS core framework that are not yet open sourced. Um, those things are, you know, it's just as we take this thing to market, it's it's a little bit of a, you know, we, we have to make sure that we're, we're um, you know, doing so in a responsible manner. And, and I, I suspect that more of the framework will become open source over time. But today, the stuff that most of the engineers care about or, and all of the stuff that the engineers should care about in the way of the parsers and these libraries is all open source. Um, that's great for you to be able to kind of, you know, as I'm developing new test cases, one of the things to do is actually go out, look at that source code and, and uh, you know, borrow it, so to speak, as I'm developing new parsers and stuff. So absolutely. Great. And one other question just came in that maybe you'd be able to tackle. Does the output of the show command have to come from PyATS? Or can we gather the, the, the output from some other location? So I guess the root of the question is, can we use the parsers and things without PyATS? Yeah. You can. Um, I, 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 and I understand the use case. There, there's a little bit of complexity in that, that in that, uh, unfortunately, when, when you talk about something like as simple as OSPF and you say, I want to profile OSPF, that might be seven or eight different show commands that you need the output of to really get a holistic picture of what OSP, OSPF is. And so if you can provide to the parser the output of all of those commands, then absolutely it can parse it into this common data structure that we've talked about. The beauty of using it inside the PyATS framework is that you don't have to know what those five, six, seven, or eight commands are beforehand. You tell it to profile OSPF, and if those seven commands are, are X, Y, you know, X, Y, Z on iOS XE, but maybe A, B, C, D, E, F on NXOS, again, you don't have to worry about that. It takes care of it for you. But if you absolutely had to and you're collecting some output from somewhere else, or maybe you've got it collected as part of a, you know, some other management tool, if you map the right output to the right parsers, it will absolutely parse the existing data that you have. Cool. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Those are great. Uh, I'm excited to see the demo. I'm sure the audience is as well. All right. So I'm going to switch over here. Let me just restart my session here. Um, so what we're going to start off with is kind of an interactive view of PyATS. And, and, and I like to demonstrate this from the, the standpoint of this little uh, wrapper that I created. And we'll provide a link to it um, in the show notes. But I call it iPyATS. And it's just a good way, because PyATS is Python, as I'm developing test cases, I want to quickly connect into the network and start to see what all of the different APIs and libraries that I have available to me uh, um, are. And, and I, IPyATS, I find it was just kind of my personal workflow. I figured somebody else might uh, might find it useful, and so I, I put it up on GitHub and, and uh, 
you know you can you can absolutely check it out what it does though really is is just takes a testbed file which as i mentioned the testbed files themselves are um just yaml file i'll, I'll take a quick peek here at the uh, uh um you know the one that we're working with here we happen to be using uh, the devnet always on sandboxes so i've specified a csr 1000 and a nexus 9000 out of the uh, the devnet sandboxes and those are the ones that we're going to be using for some of the demos i also have a more complex evpn fabric that has a number of spines and leafs in here and, and so by passing at those testbed files we're able to um, uh, uh, connect to these devices and use them as python objects so as an example here once i have the testbed loaded up you can see that I have the testbed object and I have it named my VXLAN EVPN fabric. I can look at what are the devices that I have available to me and I can create aliases for me to start to work with some of these devices. So I'm gonna say my leaf one is testbed devices leaf one. Again, notice the very Pythonic interface to this. Everything's an object and we support dot notation uh, for dictionary looks lookups uh, and, and stuff of that nature. So I'm gonna create a couple of helper uh, variables here, test bed, devices, spine one. And, and I can do some interesting things, you know, some basic stuff, like maybe I want to connect to leaf one. And when I connect to leaf one here, it's gonna actually connect, establish an SSH session, and also create what I call an automation friendly environment for me by default. So it's gonna disable some logging, change my terminal width, change my terminal length, kind of those macros that you probably have set up in your putty sessions or things like that are now translated into the Python of this. I can also explore and query the test bed. I can say, is there any links between leaf one and spine one now? And it's gonna return a set of all of those links for me, uh, you know, based on the description or based on what we know about the topology. <coughs> Excuse me. And I can also do, you know, everybody's favorite thing, which is to execute some commands against the devices here. So I just have an execute method, which actually goes out and stores all of the kind of the, the show commands and things like that. Now, again, what you have here is basically, uh, you know, on par with what you would see with a NetMiko or things like that. Where we take it to the next level is when we start introducing some of the operational stuff here. And I'm going to cheat and I got my copy and paste here. So let me grab this. What this command is doing is it's going to, um, you know, one of the other things in the IPy ATS library is some tasks that, you know, we feel like are kind of common tasks. One of them is get the routing table. So I want to actually go out, connect to the device, and it's running all of these show commands for me to get the output of the routing table itself. But more importantly, when I look at it from the object's perspective, that entire routing table is now stored as a kind of a Python dictionary that, I could, that makes it easy for me to do things like query for a specific route, make sure that that route's actually present. So we'll show an example of that here where I'm going to do a lookup on the routing table. Uh, grab my pointer here. And here's a, an example I want to look at in the VRF default and address family IPv4. Make sure that I have a route to 10.2.1.1 slash 32. You can see that I absolutely do. Um, and so that makes it very easy. I don't have to parse that routing table. It's done for me automatically. Um, I also, you know, if you wanted to point out, like if you want to see how that kind of magic happens, there's a little show source method here, which will allow me to look at all of the tasks that I have available and see how the source code is. And again, this are just kind of helper functions for me that save me having to kind of, you know, write these five or six Python commands. Um, you get, you can absolutely kind of create your own helper functions to do similar for whatever tasks that you come with. You know, one other demo here, we've used BGP as the example a number of times. So let's look, take a look at what that might look like. So the first thing I want to do is actually say I want to create a new object called BGP and I want to do, um, you know, learn about BGP on leaf one. And I need to do, do, do tasks dot learn BGP. 
And so here it's going out again and that's executing all of the various commands that are required for me to get a good picture of it. Going back to that question about can I parse my own data, you absolutely could, but if you notice what's happening here, it starts with kind of the high level basic stuff, gets all of that from a, a, you know, a, a BGP table perspective, but then it's also iterating through each of the neighbors that it detected in those previous commands and getting the detailed level information about each of the neighbors as well. And, and so it, it bodes more well to having this be automated through PyATS than grabbing your own output from the various commands as that can be dynamic. So now here's the structured data for BGP on this particular device. And if I need to query something or find out if a neighbor is established or something like that, it's very basic Python for me to figure that information out. I'm gonna switch gears here. So that so we covered the PyATS, um, kind of basic execute, show, show commands, connect to devices, the, the sort of mom and apple pie stuff. Uh, now we're going to switch over and go to the other library, or the other uh, one of the other libraries that Genie offers, which is the Conf library. And the Conf is exactly what you would expect for uh, you know objects that I'm going to actually do some configuration stuff against. I will um, uh, you know learn about the configuration. So instead of a show command, it's do you know show running config and parsing that information to give me an object representation of what the configuration of a device should be. So to get started with this, I'm gonna import uh, libs, comp, and I'm gonna stick with BGP, and we're gonna import the BGP object. And I'm gonna get all of the BGP's configuration from a device by doing a learn config method here. And I'm gonna learn the config of my NX device and I need to connect to the device first, which is telling me uh, nx.connect. This is sort of a, a gotcha that's worth pointing out and you can see I kind of always fall for it myself. Because of the dynamic nature of some of this, not all of the methods are gonna be available to you unless you're actually connected to the device and it's done the initial parsing to say, oh, this is an NXOS device, and so I need to know here are the parsers that I load. So let's try this again and see if it works a little bit better for us. So now we've ran the, the show running config BGP, um, and I can look at my BGP's configuration. It's a list item for consistency. In the case of BGP, right, there can only be one BGP process running on a router, generally speaking, but with other features, HSRP or OSPF, you might have multiple instances of that particular feature running on the device. And so we return it as a list. So to get drill in here, I'm just gonna change this to, to be my one instance of it. And I'm gonna say BGP equals BGP's zero. And now I can do things like BGP build config. So even in this case, we've parsed the existing configuration uh, um, from the device, but we could also construct our own Python object for BGP and then use the libraries to actually go out and push that configuration to the device. And so here you see, while the, the, the output that we had only had a few handful of commands, we also understand the default behavior of the box because we've interrogated the operational state of it and we know that things like graceful restart or these other kind of features may not necessarily show up in the running config but they are in fact enabled and so we want to be explicit when we push that configuration down to the device and so here you see us building the configuration now when we talk about this in the context of triggers and verifications maybe what we want to actually do is remove that configuration and so we'll actually do the build unconfig in this case it's actually taking that configuration off of the device the good news is is that we can put it right back on the device if we want to right so that's sort of the library that that does all of your configuration stuff i i um i like to say it's just like ansible only awesomer Moving on, we'll talk briefly now about test cases, right? So now we've connected to devices, we've executed commands, we've parsed those. What do we wanna do with that information? And, and the first thing to understand is that 
a test case is just Python, right? And, and there's a lot of boilerplate code that's out there for you to use. I'm gonna run through a sample test case here, which is showing you all of the uh, uh, you know, kind of framework stuff, the report summary, success rates, things like that. And you can see here I have a test that's actually failing. Well, let's look at our source code and figure out why that test is failing. Our source code in this case is looking at a, you know, here's the common setup. And again, there's a lot of Python out here, but most of this is just boilerplate code that you can download off the repos that we'll point you to in the show notes. And you can see here's my subsections. And then when we get to the meat of my test case, I have a setup step in here and I'm setting a couple of variables. And then I'm checking to say, hey, if these things aren't equal, right, um, then, you know, fail the test. And so you can imagine uh, uh, you know, in more real world scenarios, things like, hey, if CRC errors on an interface isn't zero, fail the test. Or if a BGP neighbor isn't in the established state, simply call self.failed, pass it your message and move forward. So for the sake of demonstration here, we're gonna take away the logic that says one and two should be equal and we'll rerun the test case um, and our test should now pass. So again, very basic test case scenario here. But the point being is that this is just Python. And when you take the framework of PyATS, you don't have to be a crack Python developer to create very, very robust test cases because a lot of the heavy lifting is done for you by the framework itself. Moving into some more uh, interesting test cases here. Um, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna run, kind of building on top of that, that basic test case, is we're gonna say exactly what I just mentioned. If a BGP neighbor is configured on a device, then that BGP neighbor should be in the established state. Otherwise, there's a condition that, that, that we need to know about and maybe we need to investigate further. Um, and so that's what the, the following test case is gonna do. One thing to note here, I, I make extensive use of make files in my, uh, my demos simply so that I don't, you know, have fat finger commands when I'm typing. Uh, Hank always likes me to point out what the make file does. In this case, I'm gonna issue the test target, which is going to run a, 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 a program called EasyPy, which is the runtime environment for PyATS test cases. I'm going to pass it the Python file and I'm going to pass it a variable, which is the test bed that I want to execute that, that uh, test against. So you can imagine you have a you know, test environment, prod environment, maybe a data center one, data center two environment, and you can represent those inventories as different test bed files and reuse the exact same test over multiple topologies because we don't care what type of device it is. We don't care how many devices there are when you factor in things like looping over the devices that are in the, the test bed and so on and so forth. So enough talking, let's actually run the, the BGP check job here. And while this is running, it does take a few minutes. It's gonna go out and it's gonna do kind of a superset of what we've shown today. It's gonna create that automation friendly environment, log into the, all of the devices, run all of the required BGP commands for us. Let's let that run for a second and let's take a look at the, the code that we're actually executing here. So in my first step of my test case to verify whether all the BGP neighbors are established, I'm going to make sure that I can actually learn about BGP on all of the devices. So I have a very, very simple uh, um, uh, loop here that says, hey, for all of the devices in this self.parent.parameters, which I've passed to it in my common setup, where I've verified that I can connect to all of the devices in the network, that's the first step. If you can't connect all the devices in the network, you can't you know, pass the test because we can't verify whether BGP is there. And then I've passed those to the, the parent parameter, which is the test script that allows me to reuse these in additional test cases. So after I learned BGP on all of the devices, then my logic becomes, you know, I build a common data structure for all of the BGP sessions. And then I loop through that and say, go through each of these, parse down to a particular VRF, look for neighbors, and then for each of the neighbors, check the session state and make sure that the session state's established. And if it is, we're, in this case, we're creating a, another table uh, using a another uh, Python library called tabulate, which checks that, you know, 
pr uh, presents a pretty table for us in our log messages. And then finally, we say, hey, if there's anything in the failed dictionary, which gets populated if the state is not established, we add it to another data structure here. And then finally, if anything exists in that dictionary, we say the test failed. Otherwise, all of the BGP neighbors are established and we're good to go. So if I switch back over here, you can see the test run. Obviously, it parsed a whole bunch of BGP commands on a whole bunch of devices for me. Uh, it printed this nice pretty table using the tabulate library showing me all of the, the devices, the neighbors that are configured on them, and whether they were established or not, and then an indication of pass fail, which is also provided to me by the framework itself. So I get the pretty message here. The point there is, you know, it, it, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to log the same table, but maybe in the case of one of those, you know, one neighbor is failed, uh, you don't want to, you're going to fail the whole test case, but you also want the forensic data to say, why did that test case fail? And so you can have it right there in your log messages um, to, to make your, your next steps uh, more clear. Um, and then on a similar note, I want to show one last um, example here, which is, uh, and I mentioned this one before as well, we want to check to say if the, um, if an interface has CRC errors, that's something that we want to know about. In this case, I'm going to take a test case that's written in Python, very similar to the BGP one that I showed, but we're going to abstract it with the robot framework and kind of see the difference. Notice that we're losing a lot of the noise on the console and so you, you don't have all that back scroll information, but you do still get the basic information to say, is the test passing or failing? So here we're doing an initialization phase. And while this is running, I'll pop over and show you the, the um, library here, that's, or the test case that's doing it. Very, very similar, right? We're constructing a common data structure, looping over all of the devices in our test cases, getting counters, checking for the presence of something in the, the CRC errors counter, and then creating a tabular uh, view of that for diagnostic purposes. And then finally checking to see if we have something that's a CRC error, we're gonna fail the test uh, and so on and so forth. But again, rather than having all of the back scroll here, we're going to uh, just see a nice pretty uh, console level output that gives an indication of pass or fail. In the case of a fail, we might get uh, you know, some reason or some indication as to why that is. And then once this uh, is completed, the other nicety of the robot framework is that it allows me to, uh, to generate some really pretty reports, which we'll show here in a second if the test ever finishes. I'm gonna quickly, oh, there we go, now we're done here. So the interfaces have all um, checked, they've all passed, and as I mentioned, it generates some really nice reports here. So let's take a look at the report that got generated from the robot framework and open that up in our browser and take a peek. So again, a nice summary report, background either green or red, depending on pass fail. And then if I want to, I can opt in to see all of that data that was actually parsed uh, from PyATS and, and, and uh, you know, drill into what actually was going on, all of the interface, the actual show commands if you wanted to verify that the tool was actually doing its job, you could, you could drill in and see all of the actual output that was there. So summing up, what did we talk about, right? We laid out a continuous network verification vision that can start with PyATS and Genie today. And as I mentioned, stay tuned for some of the things that are gonna be coming from this team. Um, there's some very exciting announcements in the way of the lab as a service offerings, as well as the S3 dashboard portal. I'll give you a brief history of PyATS and Genie talked about PyATS and the various Genie libraries that goes along with it. And, and we showed you a, a tremendous amount of demos that uh, show you how you might get started using this. Hank, you wanna bring us home? Absolutely, thanks so much, Kevin. Great session as always. So as we always do, we like to gather up the, the potential materials that you can use to deliver this or dive deeper into the content. Uh, the documentation for PyATS is all available and it is actually, as, as Kevin points out here on the slide, it is really quite good. It was written for people, to kind of, developers to go through and use the pieces, so that's a great place to kind of get started and take a look. The code that we've used and some of the examples here that Kevin ran through, as well as some other sample scripts are available and listed. And then Kevin's done a great job at pulling together some getting started uh, learning lab material that he's published up on Katakota, another kind of learning framework. And so those links are there as well so you can dive in and kind of walk through PyETS and Genie and test case development as it goes in. 
And then once you've gone through some of those pieces, if you're feeling frisky, please jump in and participate in our code exchange challenge. Um, figure out how to write some network verifications for different features, maybe HSRP or OSPF, um, and then submit those back in. One of the things that's going to be nice with PyETS as the community grows is having a library of example um, tests and things that we can kind of consume from each other and make available as it goes in. And that'll be the big part that makes it easier and easier for us all to consume and write really good network verification tests. And as always, we've got the general Net DevOps content up on DevNet. So uh, developer.cisco.com slash Net DevOps and then slash Net DevOps slash live to reach the information about all of the webinars, past episodes, future episodes that they're coming through. So please be sure to check that out. And with that, thank everybody so much for coming and joining us for today's session on PyETS. It's one of my uh, kind of favorite new things to learn about and kind of tackling as we go in. As always, if you haven't yet, please follow at NetDevOps Live on Twitter for all of the latest information and updates about new sessions, materials, and recordings as they're available. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.